Hi, and welcome back to Detective Story. I'm Mike Hammond. Thank you very much for joining in again. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll start off by asking you to bear with me. I've got a little bit of uh, laryngitis, I guess. I wish I had some <clears throat> heroic story as to how that come about. I do not. I think I'm just getting old, so uh, hang with me. I got the tea and honey close by. Uh, today, uh, we are doing episode X, uh, episode 16, Elizabeth of Lowe's Part 2. Uh, we started this out. As a video only presentation, and you could find that full video on YouTube under Detective Story with Mike Hammond on YouTube, Elizabeth Lowe's number two. Um, but in doing so, and so it's an interesting part of that is we went out there and filmed Bobby Rodriguez, uh, Chris Kafkas, and I went out and filmed some of the scenes, filmed interviews with her family, uh, her two sisters, her niece. And her uh, her daughter actually, I did over a, uh, a video conference. But so it's worth the time uh, if you really want to see some of the the sights and sounds of uh, where this took place. It's worth watching. As to this video, I didn't or uh, this audio version uh, rather. I didn't use the entirety of it, obviously, because a lot of it's visual, and also it was a windy. Uh, warm day on Ninety Fifth Street, which gets a lot of traffic, a lot of. Uh, Big truck traffic, it's right off the 95th Street Bridge there. Um, so the sound quality is not ideal. I'm also, as a videographer, as I mentioned, I make a pretty good homicide detective. But uh, there is some of it in there, so you get a little bit of the flavor of Bobby and I talking and Chris and I talking on the scenes about some of the feelings we got from there. So it's short, but it's worth listening to. Most important with this, uh, this podcast today is... Uh, we have the interviews and really outstanding interviews with Elizabeth's family, her two sisters, uh, R uh, Renee Ortega and Mary Lou Velez and her niece, Jen uh, Veloz. So we went to Jim's kind of enough, kind enough to have us in her house. We went, Chris and I went there and interviewed them. They were awesome. And then I also conducted an interview with uh, Roseanne Roscoe Leon, Rosie, who is Elizabeth's daughter. Middle daughter. She has uh, another daughter and a, a brother. She spoke for the Velos children. I, that, that all of that is worth listening to, I believe, because you'll get a real picture of who Elizabeth was and what she was about. Some notes about the case uh, <clears throat> we did uh, with Bobby in studio the original Elizabeth Velos part one, and in that, just briefly to go over the facts again. Uh, Elizabeth Lowe's, who was uh, 26 years old, 27 years old at the time, uh, 26 July 1992, she goes out, uh, yeah, so she'd have been 28 to be, uh, to, uh, to be square. She goes out that evening uh, dancing to uh, at a bar, Jocko's Bar at 95th Avenue and Avenue, uh, 95th Street and Avenue M. There she meets the Acevedo brothers, Richard and Victor, and Anthony Rivera. It is reported, even by their own statements, that they left together. She was, according to their story, of uh, which they told several, but uh, their end story was that the altercation are not in the car, but whatever it was, they she exited the car or was forced out on the corners of Washington and Block Streets in East Chicago, Indiana. We went there, Chris and I, and you'll hear that, in this video, and it just didn't ring very accurate that, that that would have shook out the way it did. Now, in the interim, since we have last talked and we are continuing to look at this case, we have come across the person who uh, Bobby Rodriguez tells me that saw one of the subjects walking by the Whiting, Indiana fuel farm, which if you're at all familiar with the uh, northwest part of Indiana, that east side of Chicago, Whiting, Indiana, has one of the biggest fuel farms in the Midwest. If I think it is the biggest in the Midwest and some of the biggest in the world, certainly outside of Texas. And they're, they're just big storage uh, tanks full of fuel. Uh, it's a refinery there. So allegedly, one of these three, and uh, I'll, I'll leave the name out until I get more information, it was spotted walking on that evening at about 5 a.m. by those um, the, that fuel farm. If true, that completely debunks the possibility that they could have been at Washington and Block with her at 5.30 in the morning. 
So information to follow. We will continue on that path and see what we can find out. Keep chipping away and that's the way it will go. As to today's interviews, this is kind of step two. Always, as you should know me by now, I want to talk to the families, give them an opportunity to speak and to talk about their loved ones. The Veloz family does a wonderful job of that today. Uh, you'll get a great picture of who Elizabeth was. I have some notes on there, not to belabor my entry here, but my intro, but there are some things to think about. It is, you know, I have talked to the victims, the families of homicide victims, excuse me, a little drink there. Um, Many, many times throughout my career. Too many times. <laughs> it's a rough business. There, There is a skill to it, I suppose. But the truth of the matter is you just got to be honest, upfront, empathetic without promising or, um, or, or, or saying things that you can't do, you can't provide. And uh, and get to the point and get the information you need. That's what it is. And I think families appreciate that in their the moment of their worst grieving. Uh, they want information and, uh, you know, they want to know that you are engaged, concerned. So with that, I wanted to bring up a note with that. I don't I've always been very careful with whom I interview victims, families for that reason. I want to be respectful. I have a a, a way that I that I like to do it. It's not perfect. I make mistakes. I say some things sometimes I think, oh, boy, could have said that better, but it, it's in, in exact science. You're trying to do the best you can. But I always work with partners I trusted to be able to do that well. And I didn't like to have a crowd around when I talked to victims' families. All that remains true. As you can imagine, Bob Rodriguez is a guy that I've always been very comfortable talking with victims' families. Bob gets it. He's very good at what he does. As it relates, though, to my uh, partner in, in crime in this show, Chris Kafkas, he doesn't have that experience. But I will tell you, and I think it's important to note as you listen to these interviews, uh, Chris is a guy that I've been very close to. He's my brother-in-law. I was married to his sister. We're all still very close. She's the mother of my children. We all get along great. And uh, I've known Chris for 35-ish years. So that's one thing. Also, uh, this is not something that they go around uh, advertising, but it is just uh, the truth and important, I think, to understand how his depth of well of compassion works. Their father, Chris and his sister, um, Xenophon Daniel Kafkas was on flight 427 um, in Pittsburgh that crashed in 1994 and he lost his life. Incredibly traumatic experience. I knew Chris at the time. I had met his father. Anybody who's been through anything like that, I think would understand. It is, it is a lot like losing someone in violent death. So the point to all that is, I'm not trying to front him off, I'm not trying to bring up bad history, but uh, when he sits and talks with people who are grieving, he comes from a place of personal experience. I think it's just important to note that. And so this is going much too long for an intro. I wanted to get some information out there. We are hammering away at Elizabeth Lowe's. We're not going to let this go. I think that she can be found, and it may not be the happy ending that, uh, you know, um, her, certainly her daughter would like to have, but you will hear that what they really want is just to account for. They want a place to go see her. They want a memorial for her. They want her. They want her. They want to know where she is at. So hopefully we can encourage the people who do know to do the right thing here, to move past it all and give this family peace. So without further ado, please let me tend to business a little bit. We have some cool stuff going on. Uh, we have a website that's up and we can give you some really cool opportunities to interact with us so if you choose. That is just www.detectivestory.net. And you can click on a button and communicate directly with me. Beef, give advice, ask questions, tell me jokes, whatever you'd like to do. Enjoy the interaction. It also has connections to all of the podcasts and all of those things. So we've worked hard on that that website and I, I think it's pretty cool so please check that out also we are really gaining ground we're over 10,000 subscribers on youtube really helps us a lot enables us to do a lot more for these cases and bring you more interesting stuff and try and get resolution to some of these open cases and uh, we are also really gaining ground with our downloads on the audio podcast so please if you listen to these on uh, you know apple spotify any of those audio podcast forms please download them because for whatever reason that is how they mark you know their measure of success or whatever so do us that favor 
I really appreciate it. I will talk to you briefly after we finish these interviews. Till then, take care, and I will talk to you soon. Okay, here we are outside of what was Jocko's Bar at 95th and Avenue Inn on the east side. It's now like a daycare. I'll back off and show you. But I with me, Detective Bob Rodriguez. Hey, Bob, how you doing, brother? Good, good afternoon. Thanks again for joining us here. So, Bob... Just a little bit. Can you tell me, in 1992, uh, what are we looking at here? You said this was kind of a uh, a busy bar area at the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 95th and Avenue went to be old Chaco's bar. Bar was visiting in 1916. Okay. So we're looking we're looking east here, and you Phil's Castle hamburgers down there, another joint. Those were bars at the time, yeah. Right. There was a bar down there at the time. Another bar, a block brick building on the corner on Ewing. That was uh, another bar again, Ewing Avenue, box. East and then Elizabeth lived on 99th Street in Ewing, which is four blocks going south. She was real familiar with the area. Yeah. She probably knew everybody that was in this area. Right. Probably was real familiar with everyone that hung out in the bar yeah. here uh, back in the day. Yeah. And uh, so that's common with people kind of bar hop these bars, or was it like everybody had their own kind of joint? It was more of uh, everyone having their own joint, yeah, so to speak. Kind of rough back in the day over here. Yeah. With, uh, gang activity going on, and had to be real, real careful. Yeah. Who you were at, who you were hanging out with, right? Sure, anybody that they knew who was who, so to speak. Yeah, and right. Who didn't belong in the neighborhood, right? And who was new in the neighborhood, or who may have been new hanging out in the bars. Just for reference, we're basically over the 95th Street Bridge, right? just over, just the, bridge. the famous uh, fish smoke fishery place is right there. Yeah, they did the Blues Brothers right there, the famous bridge jump. Yeah, right. Uh, that boat yard here, we're really close uh, to the waterway. What is that there? Is that the uh, Kaimet River? Yeah, yeah, Little Kel, I believe it's called. Yeah, yeah. Kaimet River right there. And so now this is, uh, we're standing up back up. Well, would have been Jocko's now. I don't want to bother too much because it's a daycare, but this is just a typical Chicago like corner bar, neighborhood corner bar back in the day. Yep. Uh, up there at the light, which you can see off in the distance, is Ewan. She lived four blocks south of here, you say, right? And she, you tell me a funny story. She lived above a bar. Tell me about that bar real quick. Yeah, it was uh, the bus. It's called uh, Moose. Moose Cholak's bar, the old professional wrestler. Moose Cholak, the professional wrestler. Right. So this neighborhood's got a lot of history, right? Sure There's does. a lot going on here. Uh, but this is where this is where our case starts in 1992, uh, when when uh, Elizabeth meets her friends, takes it off with uh, these three guys from here because uh, they, they they basically left here about 4 a.m. So, uh, all right, Bob. Thanks, man. We'll uh, we'll we'll move on to the next year. Thanks, bro. Okay. Here we are at Washington and Block in East Chicago, Indiana, which is the last place Elizabeth was seen. Supposedly got out of, pushed out of, drug out of the car with the three men. You can see there is not a lot here. Water treatment facility. Um, I don't know, Chris, what do you think? Any thoughts? I mean, this is a pretty desolate place. It's coming at 5 o'clock. Yeah, I was tell I was telling Chris as we were pulling up here. When I pull up to these scenes, I don't know, just doing a long time or some type of instinct or just some weirdness. I usually get some reaction. I'm I'm not getting any reaction here at all. This is I don't know what to make of this. We'll uh we'll keep after it and uh Next stop, let's go talk to the fam. I'd like to take a moment from the program to have a real talk about safety and security. Toward that end, I would like to introduce you to my friends over at Blue Knight Security Solutions, your ultimate partner in protection. Blue Knight Security Solutions isn't just your average check your ID at the door security company. They're a team of elite detectives, investigators, and law enforcement professionals with unparalleled expertise. Whether you need their real world investigative prowess or securing your home, business, synagogue, church, or event, Blue Knight has you covered. From risk assessment to tailored security plans, they'll ensure your safety. Home of Jim Belos. Elizabeth is a uh, cousin? Niece. Niece. Excuse me. Sorry. So, in family. So, let's tell me your name and relationship to Elizabeth. Please. Hi. I'm Mary Lou Velos, and I'm her sister. I'm Renee Ortega, and I'm her sister. Yeah. Jen Velos, and I'm her niece. Thank you very much. Who would like to start? Just give us some background. We're also here, of course, with my man, Chris Kafkis. And um, so, tell us a little bit about Elizabeth. Um, just in general, what, what, what's your, what was she like as a kid and growing up? Were you guys all close? Yes. Yeah. Very, my sister was very my sister was very outgoing. Um, she liked to just be herself, very beautiful, um, playful. She liked to joke and uh, just have her children have fun. Did a lot of stuff with her kids as well. She loved life. Yeah. And she was really good with people. She was very oriented and she had no problem talking to anybody. 
just never met a stranger kind of person, as my grandma right. would say, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I get that. And then she was older, a little bit older. A little bit older than me. So, I mean, help with makeup, clothes, that kind of advice. Yeah. Um, she loved to dance. She loved to have fun. Just silly, just kind of a silly person. Yeah. She loved to do things to make us laugh and would talk about anything. Any kind of advice that she could give, she was always willing to do so. That's great. And then... Um, she talked about her progression and she, uh, you guys, she grew up in this area in like Hammond? No. no. Oh, no, you guys from the east side? Oh, from, from South Chicago. Chicago. Oh, from South yeah. Chicago. I see. I got you. And where did she go to high school? Boom. Boom. High school? Yeah. 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 Okay. And then after high school? She worked, but yeah. then she got married and had babies. Yeah. She had two daughters? And a son. And a son. Yeah, I see. All right. And then, Chris, go ahead. You got anything I don't want to... No. Well, the, uh, during that period of her life, what was she like? And we're talking about... Those, like the, those leading in, let's say, the year leading up to... 1992. 1992. She was always happy. Yeah. And we were always joking. She's in her 20s when this happens. Yes. yes. 20, I think she was born... My memory is not the greatest. She was born in 1969? 64. 64. 64. Okay. Yeah. So she was, she was right... Uh, so she would have been about 28? Um, yes. Yeah. 28 years old. Yeah. She was happy all the time. We lived together and she was always joking, laughing. You were living together at the time? Yes. She had also just gotten into the beauty industry, so like doing nails, right. she was doing nails at a salon. Oh, yeah. That was something that really fascinated yeah. her. I mean, anything about beauty was, was about that. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. She definitely yes. loved to like, be in the mirror, fix her hair, and <laughs> making sure everything was perfect. Right. We're walking out the door. I noticed in a lot of the reports and the people described her as very pretty, very attractive. Mm-hmm. That would seem to be a... Um, Even though it was 32 years ago, this can't be easy to talk. Well, let me say, again, let me say how much I appreciate you guys spending the time with us because... I mean, I just, like I said, it's, to me, it's always important that you know, people get a picture of who, who our victims are, right? So they're not, it, that's not the end of the story. There's a lot more to them. So in, in, in that time period leading up to that, was she, so she's probably having fun right, being a 20 year old, like all of us. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. 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 I, I know this is difficult and I apologize ahead of time, but uh, what, can you recall anything about like the day, the days leading up to the last day that you saw her? The last day I saw her, she was working, so I didn't see her the day of her disappearance or the day before. So. And I saw her the night that she left the house. Mm-hmm. Um, she was always, like I said, she was happy. Yeah. You know, we were, we were just telling jokes and messing around. And yeah, she was getting herself ready. She looked very pretty when she left, you know, and she said good night. God bless you. And she gave me a kiss and she went on her merry way. So it sounds like she's just going out to have fun. Yes. I mean, there's no indication at all. There was no, any, no. any issues at all. And, yeah. Um, I mean, she asked me to go out with her and I said, no, my friends want to go somewhere else. And so she just, you know, was like, all right, we'll just have fun and be safe. I said, sing to her. And we just parted ways like we always do, you know, mm-hmm. kiss and hug. And that was kind of it. Did she talk about any like specific plan, like where she was going, who she was going to meet, anything like that? To me, she just said she was going to Jocko's. She's like, I'm going to go to the neighborhood. I'm going to stay in the neighborhood. I'm going to go to Jocko's. Jocko's was like the neighborhood meeting place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. She, she, could bar. she could walk there. How far away was the house from Jocko's? Um, you guys were 90. We were 99 in Ewing, and Jocko's is. 95th and yeah so it's not far no you know and they're not city blocks no they're so small blocks yeah, yeah. so and, and back then there were a couple bars on that street we saw so back then that was just like the just like anywhere else yeah, you yeah, go, go to the neighborhood spot you know almost right. everybody that's going to be in there you, you've even exactly. grown up with almost everybody that's in there yeah see jack was had a dance floor uh, back okay, in the day right, yeah, right. yeah. I so i mean Probably the drop. Yeah, because yeah. she loved to dance. So right. she did love to dance, definitely. And, you know, so I, you guys tell me, I'm basing this just on reading your reports, but it sounds like um, you guys had concerns almost immediately the next day. Right? Yes. Yes. And, and because she's always come home. Yeah. You know, when she went out. Or if she was going to say she would have called. She yeah, she would have called and yeah. not say anything. Because yeah. yeah. it was still all like that. Yeah, yeah. Just always communicated very right. strongly yeah, where you're at, where you're going. Night or we're going to stay away for the weekend. Yeah. We let somebody know. Yeah. So this way, nobody gets worried. Yeah. With, you know, right. And she would have never let the grandma worry like that overnight. Or right. until the next morning, she would have never done that. <laughs> she would have building. And so she would have never allowed her to have that worry like that. Right. She was consistent in that sense that she would she, say something. She was considered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 We, that's, that's kind of a very old school Chicago thing, too, yeah. right? I mean, yes. Like, and my mom would have yeah. from her. Yeah. So... Yeah. yeah, she would have said something, you know. Right. There was no reason for her not to say anything. That day must have been 
that day must have been the next day must have been rough. Confirms it to your memory. Yeah. And we went out looking for her. We got people together and we started looking for her high and low and putting up flyers everywhere. They were taking them down as we were putting them off. The neighborhood. The neighborhood. Yeah, we, they, yeah. they said they dropped her in, but yeah. it didn't stop. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah. We weren't stopping. Um, and that was right away after. Yeah. yeah. She didn't come home. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me, based on uh, being over in the neighborhood, that they'd be taking him down simply because they probably didn't want the heat, right? right. And they it also makes me believe that they don't know anything about what happened or the incident. Right. They just mm-hmm. didn't want the heat over there. It, I mean, I'm totally... That's, that's speculating on a hypothesis, but especially yeah. after the reward was issued, one of those guys, if they knew something, if they had seen her... They're going to take a shot at trying to get that reward money. Oh, one of the neighborhood people. The neighborhood people. Yeah. Yes. They're going to try and take a shot and just see if they can. So this is hard stuff. Well, let me ask you this first. But, um, what? Tell me about Beth, her demeanor. You said she's fun-loving, outgoing, friendly, and all that. But did that... I mean, she was like a follower and would go along, and if somebody gave her a hard time, she'd just let it go? Or was she more of a, if you pushed her, she'd push back? She was definitely she not a pushover. Was, yeah, she, she was, was not a pushover. No. She, was, she was definitely not one to allow something to happen without her, you know, taking care of it. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Know, right. She's trying to take care of it. Right, yeah, right, 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 right. So if she's having this, again, total speculation here, because, but... If she's having fun with somebody and they do something she deems inappropriate, she's just not going to accept it. No, no, it is. She's going to, yeah. Never. She's going to push back. Sounds like she's yeah. a fighter, it's hard to say, right? Yes. Like pushed into a corner, she's going to be a fighter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She would always take care of herself. She would never allow something to just happen to her. Yeah. Well, certainly it makes sense that somebody is considerate enough to call her family and let her know, you know, I'm going to be late, I'm not going to be home, right. is not somebody that's going to be uh, making themselves a target or a victim, uh, right? I mean, that's just my guess from my life experience. Yeah, she was, she was not the kind of person that would just go along with the crowd. She was more of a leader than a follower yeah. at any given point. So, gotcha. she just so uh, it's a tough question to ask, uh, but one of those things that I would want to know as detective, um, at what point were you pretty certain something bad was up? The next day when the next time. I mean, the very next day, yes, you exactly thought you know, something's not right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Was that based on a combination of kind of gut instinct or and knowing her? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She went on the time before. Yeah. And, uh, was home. and she always made it home. Yeah. Oh, or if, like I said, if she didn't come home or she wasn't going to come home, she always made a phone call. Yeah. And let us know where she was going to be and who she was going to be with. Yeah. yeah. And right away. Right. Understood. Um, and I'm going to ask this question, knowing how bad, it, uh, how tough question it is. Unfortunately, I've asked it many times, but my life experience tells me that uh, the not knowing what happened is as maybe as tough as if you did know and it was a bad result. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Many, many years, and we're still. And yeah, yeah, yeah. deeply affected by her going missing. It's not something that we've been able to separate ourselves from in any way. And our later generations have also kind of paid the price right. of our fear yeah, of sure. us not knowing where she is and not knowing what's happened to her. You know, we're more, I guess, nervous about like our kids going out. And even as they were younger, now that my kids are older, it's probably yeah. just as bad because right, I'm like, right. make sure you call me, call your brother, you know, make right, sure you do right, this, make right. sure you do that, so that I know that you're okay. So and how can I ask how were your uh how were the kids with it? Were they understanding because they understood what had happened, or were they more like, come on, mom? You know? Well, I mean, they're, they're, they were yeah. young kids, so they didn't want to hear, right. like, make sure you call me or make sure you come on at this yeah. time. And right, especially right. as they became teenagers, they were like, yeah. totally not wanting to do it. They did, yeah. of course, but it was definitely like, okay, yeah. enough is enough already. Yeah, yeah, they didn't understand right. where that was coming from. Right. They didn't yeah. understand where that, where that concern was coming from. Yeah, yeah that's fair to say. And, and grief isn't linear, right? There's this, yeah. there's this idea that. Grief is in stages, and that's just my experience in life has been that's just not true. Well, it's typical. I mean, you can be it ups and flows because you can be good one minute and comes, then really bad. Comes in waves, right, yeah. Yeah. big waves. Sometimes huge mm-hmm. crashing. Sometimes it's a little calm, but it's always there's always it's that. Yes, yeah. always there. Yeah. Yeah. I would tell my daughter, "Okay, make sure you call me. You get it. She called the person. Call me. Go here. Call me when you get in. 
call me, call me, call me, call me all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Call me, make sure you're okay. You know, and yeah. it still goes that way. We live three mm-hmm. houses down from each other. And we could go out together and we park the car in front of her house. I walked the three houses down and she calls me when she gets out of the car, going into the house, checking the house to make sure we're both safe. Yeah. So it, it, it never goes away. No. Right so it's, it's kind of had this lasting, uh, it's kind of a buzzword right now, but I think it's fair to say, I mean, it's just had a lasting trauma on yes, all yes, of them, yes. right? I mean, this, um, this event, um, I know how some of the traumatic experiences in my life have play out in the relationships I have with people. I'm the same way. Like, my go, the, the young kids that work for me, I'm like, I know this is going to sound inappropriate because I'm not your dad, but please text me when you get home. Right. You know? I do this to my friends. Please, please call me yes. when you get home. Yeah. Like, like, my bar back on Thursday night, if he doesn't text me when he gets home, and it usually takes him a while, if I don't see that text at four or five o'clock in the morning when I see him the next eight years in front of me. Misunderstandable. Yeah. We'll make sure those around you are safe. Yeah. And especially under this kind of circumstance, when you've lost someone in this way. Yeah. Um, I think Asian we're cognizant of danger. Yeah. We're cognizant of loss. Yep. We're cognizant that anything could happen in the blink of an eye. Yeah. The, I don't want to say the fabric of life, but the way that we understand life in the world to be flips when something like this happens. It's impossible to look at the world in the same with the same lens you did the day before. Right. We didn't do that before. We've yeah. never lived like that before. Yeah. Well, it's not to this extent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't always know each other, but to check on and say, I love you all the time. Yeah. But we were never to the point where we are. Yeah. And it's like a, a ripple effect. Mm-hmm. You know, we throw a rock in the water and you get all these ripples. And the last ripples are the biggest. Yeah. And that's how it's been. Yeah. What would it mean to you guys now to just find out what happened? Looking just to bring her home to know that she's home with us now. You know? Yeah, I'd rather be her home somewhere. We mm-hmm. don't know where she's at. I think that's the biggest thing is finding out where she is so that we can wake her to rest, so that we can finally let our minds be at rest too, let our hearts rest some. Because not knowing is it's hard. It's so devastating. Yeah, I just can't imagine. And it is. It's, it's really, really hard. Yeah. I mean, we were kids. I was, I mean, I was young. I was a kid when it happened, and it just seemed to get worse and worse and worse over the years. Yeah. And if I never find out what happened to her, it's okay as long as we find her. Yeah. Bring her home. Understood. Yeah, bring her home. Understood. I hear that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the time that's gone by, you, I, I could probably answer this for you. It's silly, but you can probably count on one hand, half of one hand, how many days you have. That you have not thought about her at all, right? The number is probably zero. Zero. <laughs> Close to zero, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get it totally. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the reason we're here and the reason we're doing this, well, like I said, Bob Rodriguez means a lot to me, and this case means a lot to him. He made a promise uh, to your grandmother, yes. right? Your mother. Yes. Uh, and that promise was that he would not forget. And he, uh, I don't know how well you guys know Bob. I think you've gotten to know him pretty well over the years. And I can promise you that guy, yeah. he is a, uh, he's a bulldog. He's not the guy you want after you uh, if you've done something wrong. So uh, we're going to do everything we can to help him get answers. Um, and for you guys as well, I mean, this is, uh, this is more than any, anybody should have to bear. And uh, we'll do our very best, I promise you. Um so what have I missed? Anything that you'd like for to say or you'd like for people to know that I ha- we haven't covered? And we've covered a lot, so the answer could be, no, we've covered everything. But... Go ahead. No. <laughs> Go ahead. It's all um, good. I mean, I know that the case was worked on extensively, and I know that someone knows something. And so those three men that were involved, whatever way they were involved, I hope they can put themselves in their shoes now that they're older and probably have children and have their own families and know how much pain and devastation that they've caused and say something by the way. Yes. Yeah. I mean, at this point, it's a lot, lot, lot less about vengeance and a lot more about peace. Right. right? right. You want to bring her home? You just want to bring her home. I mean, even at this point, if we don't get justice for her, knowing where she is and laying her to rest. It's a big deal. That's something my grandmother ever wanted. I mean, she wanted to know where her daughter was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to say again how much I appreciate you guys taking the time. It takes a lot of courage, and uh, I appreciate um, 
I appreciate the time so much. I really do. It means a lot to me. I know it means a lot to Chris. Um, uh, it means a whole lot to Bobby, to Bob. And uh, so uh, thank you very much. Um, and I do want to ask, if you don't mind, uh, you have some pictures behind you. Do you mind if I we talk about those a little bit? First of all, uh, this one on my right. One on the right, that's my grandmother, Irene. And that's uh, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah. And that's the one that uh, held Bobby's hand that he yes, yes. Uh, is very emotional about. And this, that's Elizabeth when she was younger. Obviously, beautiful, beautiful young lady. And Well, thank you very much for sharing. That. Okay, so there you have the interview with Elizabeth's sisters and niece. Very moving, very powerful stuff. And they've been through a lot. They deserve answers, and we greatly appreciate the time that they spent with us. It does mean a lot. It's extremely motivating. So there you go. Let's try and do what we can for them. Next up, we have the interview with Rosie Leon, who is Elizabeth's daughter. And she is going to give you her perspective. And it's a very, very moving conversation. I hope you appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Roseanne Leon, Rosie, who is Elizabeth Veloz's uh, middle daughter. Correct. Um, you have uh, an, an older brother, Ramon, and uh, a younger sister, correct? Yes. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you so much uh, for uh, doing this interview with us. I, I know it's emotional and difficult, but it means a lot to us. No, it means a lot to, to me and my siblings for you guys to do this. Um, we're in a new age now, so it's not like, oh, we can get it on the newspaper. It's now social media where you can get more awareness and stuff. So we appreciate a lot. No, uh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Like I said, you know, I, I have this close relationship with Bob Rodriguez and, uh, you know, he, that's the way uh, cases work for us. You know, it gets kind of in our blood and, and we, we, uh, we want to, we want a, a resolution in particular, you know, Bob built this relationship with you and your family and, uh, he really wants to know what happened. And so now, so do I, <laughs> you know, we want to find out for you guys. So, um, easy for us to uh to decide to take this up but anyway so um so tell me a little bit now as i understand it when um you were young uh nine ish um is that correct your uh your your mother elizabeth and your father divorced and your father took you to stay with his family in mexico is that correct yes when, I'm seven. when you're seven okay yes and then well, you were telling me that uh, right before you left, you had uh, what would turn out to be the last conversation with your mother. And yes. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that and how that came about? Um, so we were, they were having a going away party for us. And I believe like it was hard for my mom to even just kind of like kind of let us go um, at the time because we were leaving to Mexico to live with my father's uh, mother. And um, so she um, called us up. And it was me and my sister. I remember being in the room and she was just like, you know, just be good, stay safe. But the thing that sticks out the most is that she's like, no matter what, like, I love you. And that would always stay with me. Um, sorry. No, because no. it's like, you always want to know, like, at least that was a good goodbye. Yeah. In, in hindsight, we didn't know that was going to be her last words. We always, still even though we longed and have hope. I know it's like probably like 5%, 3% hope that we will see her again. We're hoping like maybe she had amnesia or something or somebody has her captive and she can't get out. And even though all these years, like we still hang out, hang on to that little bit of hope, you know? Um, however, like our mind does tell us like, you know, something probably falsely or something. But um, at this point, it's just trying to see where we can put her to rest. Yeah. And have a place to like have some closure for me and my siblings. Um, because it's been tough, it's been a tough road. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, just the the not knowing and, and I appreciate that that hope that never goes away, right? I mean, there's a great um and my Spanish is so weak, I work hard on it and I'm just not good at it. But there's a great um saying in Spanish, it's uh, La Esperanza. It's the ultimo. It's basically hope is the last thing you lose, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, and I wish I could remember my Spanish instructor is going to be so mad. <laughs> but um, but I I love that saying because it's true, right? I mean, hope doesn't go away. You, you no, continue no. to hold that, and uh, 
you know, yes, I, I, I have to agree as a longtime detective, the odds are slight, but you know, nothing's ever a hundred percent until it's a hundred percent. So I, I, I respect the fact that you guys, you know, keep that, keep that level of hope out there. And, you know, also really, you know, part of my belief system too, is as long as you, you know, remember someone and speak their name, they're never really gone. Right. So, um, there, there's that as well. But, uh, so then, um, when did you find out there was a time gap, right? As you explained to me before you realized that something was really up with this. And, yeah. Know. So we, we stayed in Mexico for, um, about six years. And then, so at this time already, my mom had gone missing. Um, but, um, we were coming to visit after the six years because my dad was like, the baby was going to bring us back or, or not to see we transition well, you know? And so when we came back, like we, I remember me and my sister being excited, like, Oh my God, we're going to see our mom. We're going to like get to talk to her. We're going to get to catch up with her, you know? And, um, we had been here for the whole summer until like, and we kept asking all our family members, like, Hey, you know, where's my mom? Like, like, does she not want to see us? Like what's going on? Like, does she not live here? Like trying not to be too pushy. Um, because like they didn't want to say anything. And then one of my aunts said like, you need to talk to your dad. And so like one night my dad sat us down and I was like, dad, like what's going on? Like our worst, worst case scenario from me and my sister was like, Maybe she started a new family and she didn't see this other family as, you know, like something to take with her or something like that was her worst case scenario. And, um, and no, so then my dad explained to us, like, you know, she went out one night and she never made it back home. And so like, we never really got the details. Like, I remember that night we cried ourselves to sleep. Um, and, uh, so sorry. No, no, please don't apologize. This is a lot. I know. We cried ourselves to see, but we were like, we didn't really ask a lot of questions. I mean, I was 11 at the time and my sister was nine, so we didn't really comprehend. We were just like, you know, maybe wrong place at the wrong time. And maybe she was up, you know, like it was kind of like left like that. Yeah. So that's all we knew for, for a while until like we kept asking once we came back fully and we got older. We're like, well, what really happened? And so they could just tell us what they kind of heard yeah yeah that's how we were kind of like in the book right. we've been yeah i mean that's well i just have to say i mean you know i know it's emotional for you but uh it's it's i appreciate you sharing because it's a painful thing to think about that your worst case scenario in your head um it, it turned out to be worse than what you thought it could possibly be right i mean it's just really um powerful and hard to hear but um i appreciate you sharing that with us um, I, just, I, I, just, I can't imagine what that must have been like for an 11 year old just to be um just the vacuum of what what, what are you talking about right i mean but um um and then so over the years you kind of slowly started to try and get as much information as you could right um, it's yes like, and they would tell us like oh she went out and like we'd pass like wherever they said she was dropped off or from whatever information like oh that this would have been the street and you see there's no, no telephone here and you know the little things like that and i'm just like oh okay like so years after them telling us and everything we we're just kind of like always trying to look and see like maybe we'll see her on the street or maybe you know like she'll turn up you know and no no please don't be sorry i mean you're you're amazingly courageous strong a woman and i appreciate it this is more than anybody should have to deal with especially at 11 years old but let me ask you just to shift gears a little bit to give you a little bit of space here do you recall um uh your grandmother i, I never of course let it go wouldn't change her home number she she just was never gonna let this go but your aunts were telling me that at one point, I think it was you, but you know, maybe it was your sister, but at one point your grandmother saw you coming out of a convenience store or something. And I guess that you looked so much like your mother that she was convinced that was uh, Elizabeth, your mother. 
And it was my, my, I think my aunt and my grandma were driving down uh, like the neighborhood street and my sister had come home from college without, and that was my sister. She's the one that looks like my mom, like yeah. her driver's license, my sister's the sitting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, and uh, from what she told me, she's like, I just, they, they pulled me and they're like, Elizabeth, Bethy, Bethy. And she's like, she was kind of taken back at first. Like what? Right, right, right. Like it's no, it's me. It's me. It's me, Tish. She had to tell him, it's been, but she looked so much like my mom. Yeah. So then I guess at the time that she went missing that, it was kind of like a shock for both of them, my sister and them, because she did look so much like her. Yeah. yeah she, that's a really, um, again, painful, but uh, telling story about how your entire family just every day, every day it was part of their life. And uh, I mean, they, they described to me that, um, they knew something was wrong immediately because um, she was was always in contact. They all stayed very close contact with each other every day, talk on the phone. So they were going to do this is the time before, you know, cell phones and that. So every day they were like, and uh, they knew right away that something was wrong. Um, so, um, so if I can ask, I'm putting you through a lot here and, and no. I know that I am, but, uh, and I'm sorry to do it. This is kind of the gig. Um, but so tell me for Rosie, you know, what's it been like all these years? Oh, <laughs> I know. Um, been very difficult. Um, for a long time, it was just me and my sister. So, like, a lot of time, I'm gonna go back yeah, to sure. sooner because it's like we kind of like when we were growing up in Mexico, we had to be each other's mom. So she would like cook for me. Like we had my grandma, but she would like, my sister would like get on the stove on like a chair and she would cook for me. She's like, oh, this is for you. And we kind of like, you know, she was motherly like that. And then I picked up where like, oh, okay, I, I'll do things that I'll clean. I'll like help you wash your clothes, you know, stuff like that. And and that's how we continued our relationship um, throughout the years. And with finding out about my mom, like, um, I mean, we, we even have each other's like, uh, buying your iPhone, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but we've always like let each other know where we're at, yeah, where we're going, no matter what. And like, I can see, like, she's like, are you stalking me again? Like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just see where you're at. Yeah. But I think that the effects of everything and the way she disappeared is it's made us like want to make sure like we know where each other's at yeah. and make sure that. We always, when we say bye, we don't say bye. We're like, okay, I'll see you later. I love you. It's never a goodbye. Um, and it, we're very, very, very heavy on I love yous and yeah. just see you later because you never know. Especially yeah. in our case, we we don't know. So it's like we want to make sure, like you know that we that we love each other. Yeah, right. And we're like that with our kids. And I know just growing up, it's, it was difficult because like we wanted to share like our joyous moments with her we wanted to share our, like our sorrows our big accomplishments and having our kids like we didn't get that was taken away from us we didn't get that we didn't get to have mom in the labor room with us like most most women do you know and so now as mothers like i think we hold our kids a little bit more tighter we're very aware. I mean, we nothing's promised. You know, I could go outside my house right now and get hit by a bus. I don't know, you know. I'm not sure. But knowing that what we know, what we experienced, like we just want to make sure, like I guess we're overcompensating for what we never really had. Well, so we always yeah. look also for like we've had a lot of mother figures and aunts, my grandma, but. It's never going to be the same as having your, your mother, you know? Mm. Like, I never, we never got the chance to have my mom, like, braid her hair. Like, those things that... I know they sound small and trivial, but it's like, we never got that. So, like, we always try to find that in other mother figures. And sometimes we got disappointed because we weren't, you know, their kids. And we knew that, you know? Yeah, sure. But we always longed from mother we still do even now like talking about this like it's always kind of been like a band-aid yeah. 
you know, like reporters or anybody else. And we're so thankful because like it's being shed on it, but it's kind of like a bandaid all the time. Like, oh, you know. Yeah. And we're sensitive to that. I mean, you know, I, I worked homicides for a long time and Bob and I worked in a cold case homicide unit and it's hard. We always know it's hard. I mean, the families are both thankful that somebody still cares, but also it is, we know it's opening that wound up again every time. And, uh, and so that's why we're so appreciative of, of, you know, your desire to be, want to be involved and help us and talk to us because, uh, we know how painful it is. Um, Fortunately, it's part of the, you know, kind of the process. But so uh, two quick observations. One, I think what, what I'm hearing from you, and I think that it's important for our listeners that are probably already understanding this, this, this kind of use of these things that seem small and trivial, trivial, you know, they're, they're, they are part and parcel with what a lot of us are lucky enough to have gone through life and think of things as everyday, regular life things were just stripped from you guys, right? Just just stripped out of your life completely, even to the point of uh, teaching you how to, you know, uh, comb and, and braid your hair. And those little bitty things like that become big things, right? Because every time you're doing them, you're thinking about her, right? I mean, yes. is that fair to say? Yes. I, I mean, my, my middle name is Marie. I've even, because my mom picked that middle name for me, I've given it to my daughter. Like, I could have very well named my daughter Elizabeth, but I'm like, no, this was something she picked for me, and this is something I'm going to pass on to my daughter. And I told her about my, because she's, she's 14, so she knows about, you know, my grandma, like her grandma and stuff, so. I think that's <laughs> awesome. I, I, I love that. Um, you know, I was very, very close with my grandmother, who I still think is the funniest human being I ever met. And she she lived to be 93. She had a long life. Um, I'm so sorry about that. Oh, no, thank you. I mean, she got she got everything out of life she could get. She was an amazing person. But I um, I say this often. I feel and my mother, too, lost my mother. Years ago, but I, I, I feel their presence with me all the time and i'm not a particularly spiritual person i'm not a particularly religious person whatever i'm also not anti i'm just you know a product of kind of my life experience but mm -hmm. i feel their presence with me all the time and and i love to hear how you um kind of honor your mother and honor her memory by you know passing that name that she picked for you on your daughter i think that's a not just a beautiful thing it is beautiful but it also is that um, connection that your you and your daughter will always have right to to your mother, and that it really speaks to me a lot. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so let me ask you this: uh, uh, there are no easy questions here, and this is just another tough one. But uh, you, you you're pretty amazing, so I'm not <laughs> worried about asking. Um, what would it mean to you to find? to find out what happened with your mother and if it doesn't go the way we hope find her either way to find her what would it mean to you oh my goodness a lot like um i know you're talking about your grandmother and, and those things and it's just like for a long time i would dream about my mom i would dream about her like every birthday because that was my wish every birthday like for her to come back, for us to find her, something, some news, anything that had to do with her. And I would dream about my mom. And, and it was so crazy because the dream would always be her saying bye, like she was leaving. So then I would just find myself in my dream still looking for her. And so with your question, I feel like it would give us a place. I know it's after probably the fact, but it's like, to like okay, let, let's go and just talk. You, just for us to let lay it out the good the bad everything that's going on in our life because we never got it so in this like to me i feel like it's not even so much about trying who to blame oh um, i just i mean of course we'd want that we want justice for our mother but in reality we just we want to know where she is so like that we can get some type of closure because we still have, we're still hanging on to some type of hope that she's out there living and breathing. Yeah, I mean, either way, I discussed this with your um, your aunts, and 
Um, I mean, it sounds like even with you, this is a whole lot less about any kind of vengeance or anything and a whole lot more about just finding peace, right? And 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 that connection again, however it goes uh, with, with your mother, right? I mean, is that fair? Yes, yeah. most definitely. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I really appreciate. It. I also did want to mention you have an older brother, uh, Ramon. Uh, Raymond, yes. Raymond, yeah, and um, he's got some special needs. Your grandmother took care of me. You, uh, you said, and uh, um, and I just want to let our listeners know that you know that, that she had three uh, children. Uh, Raymond um, is is being uh, has some uh, developmental issues, right, and and or something, and and so he's under care uh right now so um you you will <laughs> so, to put it on rosie i mean you're speaking for the children for uh to, for our listeners and uh yes uh, you're amazingly courageous and uh and uh you know whatever this turns out to be i promise you that uh your mother would be very very proud of you so um I appreciate the time. Have we missed anything? Is there anything that you would like to talk about that I have uh, have not brought up or should have? Um, nothing I can think of right now. Okay. Um, I just like to ask. Wonderful to you, Bob, and I think Chris. Chris, correct? Yeah. Yes, that you guys are doing this. Like, um, you know, like you think the social media, you're like, oh, you know, it's for like uploading stuff, but not really. Like, I never saw it as like probably a podcast. Yeah. Because we've done like interviews and newspaper stuff, and um, and since we were little and we were here, like we never really got a chance to like, I guess like have a say. Yeah. We were kind of like an afterthought because we weren't here. But um, thank you for letting me speak for myself and my my siblings because we I feel like everybody's been affected by it, but more so us because we haven't had her. And we've still like we still long for her. Yeah, yeah, no, that's totally fair. And uh, um, and and I appreciate your thoughts. And real quick, I'll tell you, uh, kind of a quick little uh, side note with Chris. You know, Chris is, uh, you know, so Bob and I are kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, hardened longtime homicide detectives. I mean, we we have a dedication to this. We're both retired, but you know, we have a de dedication to this and and to try and do what we can. Uh, for, for our victims' families, and and that doesn't go away because you retire. It, it's something that's always kind of with you, you know. But this for us is the process that we lay out. We want to get done. And if you you saw the first episode with Bob, it, you know Bob's emotional about it. I mean, I think that you know that time uh, with your grandmother right before she passed left a left a, a, a mark on Bob that won't ever go away. You know what I mean? And uh, I, that's part of why I respect him so much, and part of why I, I want to do this. But for Chris, Chris is, you know, he's a, he's a fun guy. He's a dynamic talker. He, you know, he's been a, uh, he's a bar owner. He's, he's been a, a bartender for 35 years. Whole life has been spending talking around people. He doesn't have the experience like we do of kind of dealing with something like this. So he is absolutely like driven. We have to find out what happened. This is, I can't live with this. You know, we have to find out what happened with her. And I say, I tell him, I know, I know. I mean, that's what we feel it. We feel it, but you got to slow, you got to back yourself off and <laughs> one thing at a time, you know, but he's, he's like a tiger in a cage ready to go, you know, so it's pretty cute. Um, That's good he, to have on your team. Yes, it is. It really is. And, uh, he, and so, um, but anyway, I mean, I've taxed you enough uh, this evening. I really appreciate the time, Rosie. It means a lot to me. And uh, uh, you've done a great job of representing uh, your family, your mother and uh, your siblings here. And uh, uh, again, this is, I, I described to you a little bit before we started, this is part of the process is we're going to keep after this and we have a plan and this is an important part right now for, for our listeners and everybody out there to get a picture of your mother and you've done a fine job of that. So thank you again. Thank you. It was hard. I know it was oh, hard. And, I've been this part of my life. Like nobody from only like maybe two people from high school know like even into college i never sh like shared this information with anybody so and my sister either so yeah. um i think that's why we were a little hesitant no uh, i totally get it and and give your sister my best and and uh um 
And uh, I think both of you are amazing people. I really do. I'm, I'm not trying to put a little smoke at you. I, I just, I'm really very impressed with how you've handled yourselves and done well. And uh, we're going to keep it up. I, I, you. I will promise you that. We're not going to let it go. Uh, I hope we can get an answer, but we are not going to stop. So uh, we appreciate that. Our pleasure. Well, you take care and um, uh, I will be in touch. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi. So there you have it. Pretty incredible women. Very, very um, emotional time speaking with them. And they clearly has have Elizabeth on her their mind every day of their life. And uh, finding out what happened with her, finding her and bringing her home, even if it's to have a memorial marker where they can go visit, means the world to them. So... I really appreciate their time with us. It's a very emotional thing to, to continue to go over this. It is a testament to the relationship that Bob Rodriguez has met, made with them and a testament to their grit and their determination to keep Elizabeth's name alive, um, that they're able to sit with us and go over this again. It really means a lot to me. It means a lot to Chris. I know it means a lot to Bobby. So. Also, again, you know, so a lot of that outdoor video, you know, it was a windy day on 95 over there. As a videographer, I make a pretty good homicide detective. Uh, it's not my forte, but I wanted to give you guys a feel of what the neighborhood looks like, what's going on there. Um, it's changed for sure. You know, um, the bars aren't over there on 95th Street like they were. That was a pretty happening spot, you know, in the early 90s. But it's relatively the same as far as structure uh, it would have always been busy. That 95th Street Bridge, as we alluded to, is famous for the uh, the jump in uh, the Blues Brothers. It's been in countless uh, movies. The Smoke Fishery is just on the other side of the bridge, which has been on the Food Channel. I, I think uh, Anti Bourdain may have visited there in his show. Uh, it is a busy area there, as you could tell while we were filming. Um, and just a note, too, I mentioned while we were on the scene of where uh, the three men allegedly dropped her off over there in East Chicago, Indiana, I mentioned in there, I don't want to clarify this a little bit, that I didn't get a feel. I mentioned to Chris, to you, the viewers, I didn't get a feel. We usually get a feel or something when you go to a scene. I don't mean that in kind of an esoteric or supernatural way. It's just, you know, your instincts, your your time kind of in the saddle with that work, You you just get some feeling or some orientation of, you know, what may have happened here or what is going on. And maybe it is something more than, you know, maybe it is supernatural and I'm just not open to that or, or, or don't get that feel, but some people might, I suppose, uh, for me, it was just, um, a sense of this isn't ringing accurate, you know, and that there are factors here that don't make sense among them being, you know, um, the, the, the players were out, when when Chris and I were over there, like the guys down the block, they're out out you know doing business. You know, um, they're out on the street looking out. They made us you know five minutes after we drived up. Not even I'm sure that's when I noticed them watching us. So they had marked us before then. You know, so it just seems like an unusual place uh, to go way out of your way to go there to drop somebody off for who's going to get out of your car. Um, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, even to dump a body, potentially, as harsh as that sounds, like it's not like it's isolated. It's not like there are people that aren't out there. And it's not like that body is not going to be found or recovered or called because, um, you know, her, first of all, her body has not been found. And second, you know, whatever else your perception may be, or you're, if you're not familiar with the neighborhood like that, the guys out working, the dope boys, the, the people out working, they're not going to want those distractions to hurt business. Somebody dumps a body, they're going to ring 911 themselves and say, there's nothing to do with us. You know what I mean? Uh, there's, there's a woman out there and just also, you know, you, you, you can't just discount that because somebody has, is out working the dope tip that they don't have some humanity, you know what I mean? And they're not going to say, Hey, you know, that, that girl looks in distress, that woman looks in distress, you know, let's, let's try and do something. So um, the fact that there's a, just a vacuum there, there is no information. Nobody saw anything. Nobody reported anything. Now it's 5 AM. 
right? And so the sun's coming up on a summer day like that. Um, it, it just, it seems unlikely. It struck, struck me as unlikely. It struck Chris as unlikely. Bob Rodriguez is, is of the same mind. Like, uh, so what's that mean? Did the, did the three guys make up that story? Did they never go there? Well, then you're extrapolating out. Don't know that. Don't want to, you know, make assumptions until you know you have to ask questions and see what makes the most sense. But you can't make, uh, you, you, you know, you just have to be open to that and say, what you know, what could have gone on here? Because this doesn't really make sense, right? There are other things that potentially make more sense. Um, so give me your thoughts on that, if you would. It, 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 you know, um, just whatever comes to your mind, let me know. Drop me some comments. I'd love to hear them and discuss them. And uh, it's a way for you to interact and, you know, help out with this. So that's all I got for today. I really appreciate it. Again, do us a favor and like and subscribe. Uh, it helps out, us out a great deal. It helps the channel out a great deal and allows us to do more of this. So that's all I got for Chris, Bobby, Velo's family. Our thanks for, you know, tuning in, giving us your interest. And um, we'll stay after. This was not going to be the last you'll hear, you'll hear about Elizabeth Flows. Bobby made a promise. And we aim to help him keep that promise. So take care of yourself, take care of each other, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.